Welcome to episode 105 of Brain Thunder. The topic we're going to talk about today affects not just millennials and unless SpaceX has a massive breakthrough in the next couple of years in moving the entire human race to Mars is going to affect us in even more drastic ways. Can you please introduce our guest, Martha? Sure. Today with us, we have Schalkia van Oosterhout, who is a parliamentary candidate for the Dutch Greens in the parliamentary election um, in 2019. And she's currently working in a coalition for NGOs on Brexit, trade, and climate. Schalkia, welcome. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. So glad to yeah. be here. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks. Um, so I would like to start this episode off by talking about Brexit. And Brexit is, you know, a, a force of an event in itself. Um, and it's touched upon a number of sensitive topics. Um, and it's caused a lot of controversy in that from both sides of the aisle. But the topics that we hear most about are lawmaking, I guess, and immigration and legitimacy, sovereignty and decentralization. But we don't hear that much about how Brexit affects the environment. So do you want to tell us a little more about that? Yeah, so I would kick off by saying over 80% of our UK environmental law originates from the EU. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, what's going to happen with that? Mm -hmm. You know, are we still going to have that post-Brexit? Mm -hmm. And um, even if that will be immediately translated into UK domestic legislation, um, what's going to happen with the enforcement of that? Mm -hmm. Right now we have the European Commission, and the European Commission will um, tell the UK off if they're breaching EU law and if they're not sticking to the targets and the rules. Um, this has happened like numerous times with air pollution, for example. Um, however, the plans that the UK government has made so far in replacing this um, watchdog, so to say, mm -hmm. are um, yeah really disappointing, not adequately funded, um, not really well structured. So we're really going to have a big governance gap, so to say, in like who is going to watch over this environmental legislation. Mm -hmm. Um, then there's also a bunch of agencies that are now um, on the European side uh, monitoring and reporting on what's happening on the UK side and um, there are currently very little plans to replace these agencies. Mm. Um, and then there's European subsidies that are now um, coming to the UK to invest in renewables, in green infrastructure um, and there's also not really any plans to replace these subsidies. Mm -hmm. um, and then when talking about the climate, of course, the big thing that's also happening is just mm -hmm. a distraction. You know, the minute that we talk on Brexit, we don't talk about the climate. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely not an issue that comes to mind. I no, I, it definitely isn't. And yeah. would you think it's fair to say that there's a chance that post-Brexit um, air pollution or climate quality in the UK, there's a chance that that could be worsened? Yeah, for sure. Um, also because, like I said, we don't have this watchdog to actually look what's happening in the UK. So if we have no means of tracking what's going on, then how do we know if the EU, of the UK is breaking any legislation? Mm -hmm. And also, um, it's not really at the forefront of anyone's mind. It's not really anything um, that they're really concerned about at the moment. So yeah, definitely these things will be, will be worsened, yeah. So can we not trust the UK to self-regulate? Uh, no, I think especially with the current government, um, you know, as they have already indicated the plans um, mm -hmm. in the withdrawal agreement, they're trying to take out the bits of environmental legislation that say that the UK cannot lower its environmental standards. And mm -hmm. Boris Johnson has said that he would like to take that out, which is already quite uh, a worrying sign. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would also say, in addition, the UK has signaled that it's willing to sign a trade agreement with the US. Now, we all know that the U.S. is planning to withdraw from the Paris mm -hmm. Agreement. Mm -hmm. So, um, to me, it's a bit strange that you say, on the one hand, we have a climate emergency, but then on the other hand, you know, you are not uphol upholding your environmental standards. And, um, yeah, so all of these signs are a bit worrying, I would say. Yeah. That is very worrying. Um, yeah. And that leads me to think, you bringing in the U.S. as well. Yeah. So, Trump wanting to pull out of the Paris Agreement yeah. and then Britain leaving the, well, the EU regulations, yeah. this sort of rise in populism, it does kind of distract, like you said, from the overall issue of climate change. Do you think the lack of coalition amongst nations is going to affect, in a, in a worse way, yeah. already the issue we're facing? 
for climate change. Yeah, especially when talking about climate, it doesn't stop at the border. And in order to tackle this cl crisis, you have to work together. So Brexit in itself is already, you know, not great because this European cooperation was always really strong in this United Nations context. So, um, you know, I would really hope that post Brexit, even if the UK does not function anymore in the European framework, that they still continue this cooperation. Um, because that's crucial in order to, to solve it and to like adequately formulate mm -hmm. policy decisions that will work. How yeah. do we make sure that the momentum stays stays up within yeah. the UK, given those changes in the in the worldwide um, in the worldwide setting? Yeah. So actually, there will be a really big uh, global climate strike on mm -hmm. the 20th of September, and next week there will be a big climate summit. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully, you know, the momentum will keep up. And mm -hmm. I also think the signs have definitely been there. There will be a lot of strikes happening mm -hmm. um, this Friday in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, it's definitely a concern that we just have to keep on going. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, the UK has declared as one of the nine countries in the world a climate emergency, which is great in itself mm -hmm. um, but then if you are um, you know still talking about expanding Heathrow mm -hmm. and you're still not yeah. talking about you know implementing a proper environmental watchdog and um, yeah it's all a bit contradicting so I think you know as as environmentalists and mm -hmm. as just people on the street we just have to be very careful and remind our politicians about mm -hmm. this big task ahead yeah. yeah. So on that topic, actually, on the topic of strikes, um, we've obviously seen it in the UK with the Extinction Rebellion. Do you feel like there has been a direct effect on environmental policy as a result of these strikes? Um, I think it has definitely helped to build up momentum. Um, I think in 2018, there was this intergovernmental panel on climate change that published this wor very worrying report that said, like, oh, we only have 12 years to tackle the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And then, um, inspired by the, the Parkland shootings, Greta Thunberg started her climate strikes in front of the parliament. And I think definitely that has helped um, raise the topic high on the agenda, mm -hmm. um, not just in the UK, not just in Europe, but really worldwide. Um, and the extent to which it has actually changed policy, um, I think that's a very difficult question. Um, and I would say that so far, in Europe, at least, it has not. Mm -hmm. um, but there are plans to um, write this Green New Deal, and that's also happening in the US. Um, yeah, and then it's our task to build up that pressure and make sure that they actually, um, you know. <laughs> but with a more cynical view that I've heard, is it too little, too late? Is it too late to change the impact of what we've caused to the planet at this point? So it is true that there is still a very small chance that we can stay below this 1.5 degrees. I think mm -hmm. the chances of doing that is around 5%. So yes, um, we are very late to the game, but um, I am optimistic. I do feel that people have woken up and I do feel that also politicians um, see that there is this big task ahead. Um, and you know, even the most conservative parties have raised climate as one of their issues. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we should be very careful for though is um, having this business as usual approach, you know, just adding a little tax here and there and then just hoping that it will all be fine. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, actually pushing for the system change that is needed. Um, yeah, that is something that we're gonna have to push for because I don't really see that happening. But I do feel that there is slight reason to be optimistic, yeah. So you mentioned that a lot of political parties have included or started to include environmental issues in their agendas. Um, and I would like to talk about the rise of green politics across Europe. Um, and we've seen a rise of 40% more MPs in um, the Green Party just in the last election. Um, and you know there's, there's a rise of, as we said, very public environmental campaigns just yeah. with the Amazon forest just more lately, but also with the climate strikes in 120 countries on the 20th of September. So how um, do you see the rise of green politics and to what extent can we make a change through, um, through environment becoming an issue in, in political parties' agendas? Yeah, so um, as a candidate for the European Parliament elections, I've done a lot of debates with mm. political parties across the spectrum. And what has been really interesting is that for the first
first time, as I said, you know, also right wing parties have actually mentioned climate as a big issue. Mm -hmm. And I have not been to a single debate where climate was not one of the big issues. Mm -hmm. So that is great in itself. Um, however, what worries me and what also angers me a little mm -hmm. bit is having some of these right leaning parties claim that has always been um, on Imagine. their political yeah, agenda right. and um, that they've done so much. Mm -hmm. um, because it's also uh, a matter of what you're not doing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. You can say, mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna implement this carbon tax, which yeah, might have some effect. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned earlier, if you then also say, we're still gonna expand this airport, we're still gonna subsidize fossil fuels, um, then you are really giving the wrong signal. It's contradictory. So it's about being coherent yeah. and it's about um, also after elections, mm -hmm. um, sticking to your to your views and doing what is needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's still a big change or like a really big um, difference in opinion um, of what is needed. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's great that this environmentalism has come to the forefront, but the system change that is needed is mm -hmm. not really accepted by all of the political parties, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really kind of scary. I, yeah, because yeah, you, you want to trust, well, you want to trust politicians, mm. but is it just a trend now that they say they care about climate change and then they don't actually follow through? Um, yeah, and I think, um, you know, the people or the politicians that have most to lose are always a bit wary of change. Mm. Um, mm. And this whole business as usual approach mm -hmm. um, is, of course, working for the economy and mm -hmm. is working to, you know, continue... Um, their economic ways as we know it. So yeah, change is scary. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, with always the next election in mind, it can be a bit scary to implement these these changes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you have to do what is needed. Unfortunately, a lot of the disadvantages from climate change and bad environmental policies is obviously felt by the more developing countries and also is not always felt equally depending on the different genders. Yeah. Is that something that you think is getting enough press? Is that new age? Is that new age?